Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to today's webinar, which is brought to you by Shared Services Link in association with Vertex. Today, we're looking at unlocking global growth, navigating indirect tax in new markets and digital channels. My name is Susie West. I'm delighted to be introducing as our presenters today, Niall Kernan, who is Senior Director of Product Management, E-Commerce and Marketplace at Vertex, and Gaurav Patney, who is Director at EY. So first off, let's take a look at drivers and trends. We'll take a quick look at the background as to what's causing these trends. What we know is the e-commerce space, very fast evolving space, and particularly over the last eight to 10 years. And what's happened is really it's outpaced tax legislation. So if we look at the top left here, the legislation, it was initially focused on domestic transfer, bricks and mortar, but it's changed now. So the legislators are trying to keep up with the evolution of this e-commerce wave. Down in the bottom left, what we have is the OECD. And really what they're trying to do is ensure cooperation between the various legislators or administrators in the different countries or tax regions. So they have a big challenge there to try and pull all this together. Top right then, this is critical, redefining tax presence. So again, traditionally, bricks and mortar domestic trade, it was very easy to define whether or not someone had a tax presence in a certain jurisdiction. Of course, now with cross-border trade, what we see is you know, companies outside of that jurisdiction benefiting from selling into it. So there has to be a redefinition of what equates to something having a presence within the country. And then, of course, we have constant change in legis legislation. One example here, the digital services tax. As the legislators try to expand the tax ban for various countries or various companies that trade in their countries, there's so many new types of companies coming out. You know, if you take a look at the likes of Facebook, for example, who benefit from having their services in certain countries, but may not actually sell a, a product into that country. So again, the legislators are trying to come up with new ways to bring more people into the tax net to evolve that tax band. The main trends we see then, of course, we talked about there, the growth in e-commerce, huge trend. Everybody wants to get on board, but allied with that then is the increasing reforms. And as soon as new business models come out and get Gar will look at a couple of these for us, the legislators are trying to introduce new reforms to match those business models. Of course, quickly following on from e-commerce, we have the likes of Amazon, these marketplaces, and they're facilitating three-party sales. And of course, then the legislators are trying to look at how do we actually ensure that we're getting the most people into the tax net and making it as efficient as possible. One of the obvious things there is let's make the marketplace responsible for collecting the tax. Again, we'll have a bit of a deeper look at that. And finally, the likes of real-time reporting and e e invoicing or continuous transaction controls under the, the broader umbrella, the digitization of the indirect tax sphere. So first off, if we look at the international sales journey, so this is the cross-border sales journey. If we look at the items here circled in red, again, over the last eight to 10 years, these are newer jobs that have come out for businesses that are trading online. So if we're looking from left to right, tax location validation, again, in the past, when it was a domestic transaction, bricks and mortar, it was easy to identify where were companies located. Nowadays, it's becoming more complex online sales, and whether it's digital services or physical goods, there's more onus on businesses to ensure they know where they're selling to. In the B2B space, we look at something like tax ID validation. And you know, again, a key component of that business-to-business -business sale is really around that reverse charge mechanism in the VAT sphere. Or actually in the US, you know, you have the exemption certificate management. So another job that needs to be done. Generating customer invoices, online invoices or digital invoices, or in fact, generating an e-invoice now, as we talked about in the digitization of indirect tax, very important. Key component threshold monitoring. How do I know I'm liable to pay tax in a certain region or jurisdiction? Talking to that where in the past it was physical presence, those rules have now changed. Another job for the seller to keep account of. And remittance service in terms of now that I do owe or have a liability in a certain country, how do I sure that I'm able to pay that liability depending on what currency I need to pay it in and how I need to remit those funds? And finally then, of course, with invoicing, you always get the credit notes and how do I match that credit note back? It's a very fast changing world. So what I'd like to do is just to talk through a survey we've done recently and some of the key components, the changes in business that we see and the changes in how people are operating within this world. 
first off, we see the e-commerce world, it's, it's a very easy world to get into to start trading in. And we see 68% of companies telling us that they've traded internationally in the past two years. As long as you can trade internationally, it's a much broader market, right? You're not restricted to your own market. As a consequence of that, we've actually seen 83% say that they have a turnover increase the last financial year, which is huge. Again, expanding business. Of course, we talked about the growth of e-commerce and 59% see it as a key growth opportunity, and 51% focusing more and more on their e-commerce business. And we see a lot of this transition from a bricks and mortar into an e-commerce business. And of course, at the bottom here, what we really see is customer experience is key. So ensuring that it's frictionless. Anyone who's familiar with online trading knows keeping the attention of your customer is really important because a lot of high percentage of customers will opt out at the basket, at the checkout, if it's not frictionless. So that's a really strategic piece, an important piece to ensure for online trading. Now let's take a look at some of the barriers though, on the flip side of this. We see that these new regulations are creating a significant barrier to growth. The indirect tax generally 54% saying, hey, it could put their growth at risk. We know companies want to expand, and then they start to speak to the tax department or the tax people who say, hey, but did you know you have to meet all these requirements? And suddenly the brakes are put on. On the other side, the operational side, 46% saying, hey, actually there's, a, there's an overhead in managing this tax, and that puts the business at risk. Can we support that overhead? How many people do we need to hire to support it? So again, another consideration. After that, businesses are also then concerned about what's new that's coming in. So again, 44%, what's the impact of COVID going to be in terms of indirect tax changes? And on the right-hand side, 43% concerned about the US. We know the US is a very big market. It's a very appealing market to get into. As you start to understand it better from an indirect tax perspective, of course, you start to realize there's thousands of tax jurisdictions in the US that need to be catered for. And how do you manage that complexity? If we continue on this trend in terms of the barriers to cross border, it's not just the US. We also have more and more VAT rules coming in. And the VAT rules are slightly different to the US in terms of VAT rules often focus on more than just the calculation or the jurisdiction. Things again like online invoicing, e-invoicing, VAT ID validation. So they add even more complexity. And unfortunately, what we see within businesses is a lot of resources are still being spent internally to manage these indirect rules. We see 52% still developing their own in-house software to manage this. So it's development resource that could be spent on growing the business that's actually being spent on managing indirect tax. And extraordinarily, from our perspective, 41% still doing this manually. That's human capital or human resource that's spending time orchestrating and managing indirect tax on spreadsheets that could be spent growing the business. A lot of opportunity here, and we just need to work through it. Thank you, Niall. Hello, everybody. I'm going to take you through the evolution of e-commerce sales and how business models have evolved over the last few years. EY did a recent survey and the couple of key takeaways from that survey, which I found it very interesting, are there are 32% consumers who now seek out brands which provide enhanced delivery experience and brand experience. And then there are 55% consumers who believe that technology has changed their lives for better and are seeking out more ways using technology and for buying goods. So with the changes in the buyer preferences, what we've also seen is how companies and brands have evolved. So on the right hand of the screen, what you see is a traditional commerce model where you would have a manufacturer, a wholesaler, a distributor, a retailer, and then the customer. But with technology and the consumer's buying behavior changing, what's happened is you've just completely cut out the middleman. The wholesaler, distributor, retailer might still exist, but in parallel, what you might also have is a lot of digital buying and a lot of direct to consumer supply chains where a consumer sitting in one part of the world can actually buy the goods directly from the manufacturer. We expect that this kind of evolution in the supply chain will continue to happen. The latest trend that we are now seeing is quick commerce, click and collect, where you would now have local retailers offering the online digital experience to consumers. So with the business changing, with the buyers changing, let's look at some of the key trends that we see in e-commerce. The first key trend is you get to access a 
consumer globally. What happens is if there's a consumer sitting in Australia and I'm, I'm a supplier sitting in the UK, I've got direct access to that consumer without the wholesaler or the distributor network. Now I have access to this global market. So what that also means is the cross-border transactions have increased over the past few years, but that doesn't mean the complexities around cross-border transactions have reduced. We still have the same customs, VAT, local compliance obligations. It's just that we see more of cross-border transactions now. The third trend is there's a lot more focus on consumer centricity, and that is to build the stickiness of consumers to brands. So brands, companies try to offer the best experience to consumers, be it in terms of delivery times, be it in terms of delivery experience, or even in terms of things like customer returns. But, you know, customer returns, reverse logistics, all of these things a lot more complexity from a VAT perspective. The last trend that we see is like a seamless offline and online experience that we typically call an omnichannel. A lot of businesses are looking for this experience. They want to make sure that the same experience, the consumer who walks in into a retail outlet would have it when he's buying online. If he's bought something online, then he has the flexibility of going to a retail store in some country and to be able to return it. Now that sounds all fantastic and brilliant from an experience perspective, but you can imagine the amount of tax complexities it can bring. Now we've looked at how the industry is evolving. Let's also look at a bit of a VAT update from a global perspective, how tax authorities are looking at these transactions. So what you see on the screen is a map of the countries which have now implemented special rules to tax e-commerce transactions. None of these rules existed about five years ago. And in the last five years with the boom in the e-commerce sector, which first happened in Asia, Asia Pacific, and is now catching up to the Western part of the world, you're seeing tax authorities looking at these transactions and saying, while our traditional VAT rules do not capture some of these transactions which happen on a cross-border basis and the supplier may not be in the same country as the buyer. So what's the best way to tax it? And then that was really the start of the special e-commerce rules as we call them. It started with Australia and New Zealand 2018, 2019. UK did it in 2021. EU followed. Norway, Switzerland have similar rules. I think Singapore on the 1st of January implemented some special e-commerce rules. And then there are other countries like Malaysia with Vietnam and Philippines that are also in the process of implementing them. Let's look at what are these e-commerce rules in summary? What are these rules designed to tackle and how do they work? While every country will have some difference in terms of how they're implemented, I want to give you a bird's eye view of what they try to capture. The first thing these rules do is they remove any kind of exemption around VAT and customs duties on low value goods. Historically, and this is since the time the VAT system has been developed, there would be exemptions from VAT for low value goods. In the UK, it would be goods which are valued under 15 pounds or 22 euros in Europe. The first step has been removal of that threshold because tax authorities felt that is the value of goods where the most amount of VAT fraud and the VAT gap came from. So anything that you basically import in the country which implement e-commerce rules will be subject to tax. The second change that's happened is low value goods, which are generally goods around the $150 mark, 135 pounds in the UK, 150 euros, $500 in Singapore. They are now subject to VAT in the country where the customer belongs, irrespective of where the goods came from. Even if they're imported, they will always be taxed in the country where the customer is located. The third and probably the most significant part of this change is the deemed supplier rules. Not every country has implemented it, but it's the intention of most countries to capture online marketplaces that facilitate these transactions where online marketplaces are not generally buying and selling it, but they are made deemed supplier from a VAT perspective. Now, the reason why that's important is because tax authorities feel that instead of administering thousands or hundreds and thousands of merchants who have a very low scale, it's probably better to tax the online marketplace who have visibility for all of the transaction. In the past, online marketplace might have the data, but they never went beyond at the stage of just making sure the sale happened. But now they have to collect the data to be able to accurately estimate account and then remit that back to the tax authorities. Some consequences of these three broad changes have been, firstly, there's been a requirement to register locally in the country where the customers are located. So if a supplier based in the US sells something to me, I'm based in the UK, then if those goods are low value goods, then the supplier will have to register in the UK and account for UK VAT through its normal UK VAT return. The second impact is that supplier will have to determine the tax liability based on the country where the goods are shipped to and every country has a different VAT rate. So you'd have to have that knowledge where the goods have been low value goods. Now you have to apply the local VAT rate, be it standard rate, reduced rate or zero rate. 
The third would be again every country would have their unique requirement around invoicing around how the goods need to be returned any kind of export and import formalities if they have been done on a cross border basis. The fourth impact as we discussed is the online marketplaces so they'll have to collect all the data and in a lot of cases be able to make a very quick decision at the checkout page what is the rate of VAT that will apply and who needs to account for that VAT and pay to the tax authorities. The last would be there is some benefit with the online marketplace rules that there is increased transparency and the chances of tax fraud are lesser now and also shifting on the burden to marketplaces has meant that the smaller sellers who primarily sell on marketplaces or businesses who sell on marketplaces the obligation has been taken away from those businesses to the marketplaces. So if you are solely selling on a marketplace then you probably benefited in a way that you don't have to worry about a lot of tax compliance as that will be taken care of by the marketplaces. So now we understand how these rules work. What I want to do is take you through a couple of case studies. The first case study is something that we very commonly see clients implement and on what we advise on. It's a scenario where you've got an offshore supplier who probably has some stock in an overseas location. In this case, we've chosen an example of a supplier based in the UK who has stock based in EU for sales to consumers in EU. Now, obviously, when they bring that stock in EU, prior to sale there will be export and import formalities they would have to consider so their systems should be able to accurately predict all of that for them. then subsequently when consumers in EU like in Germany Belgium Netherlands in this case when they buy the goods that supplier will have to accurately estimate the amount of VAT on that transaction based on German VAT rules Belgian VAT rules and Dutch VAT rules the rates can vary the VAT treatment can vary the invoicing requirements may vary so you would need to be mindful of all of these things prior to implementing a model like this, which seems to be a very straightforward model, but from a tax perspective, it can have complications. The other thing to note here is you would need to collect certain pieces of information to be able to make that decision. So based on the different categories of products that you have, you need to have VAT rate classification. You need to know what is shipping address. And in a lot of cases, what we see is shipping address might be different to billing address. But from a VAT perspective, when it comes to goods, often you would consider the shipping address and not the billing address. So it's important that your system is configured to be able to make those decisions for you very accurately. The next case study, from a commercial legal standpoint, this model is quite straightforward because as a business, I am not selling to a marketplace. I am merely selling to final consumers who go to a marketplace and the sale is direct to those consumers. But after the introduction of the marketplace rules, there are some complexities now, which I will try to summarize. The first thing that happens is, again, if you're an offshore company, which probably has stock in the locations where that online marketplace has warehouses or fulfillment centers, you would need to consider your registration requirement in those countries. Moving stock from your country of establishment to an overseas country where the warehouse is located, does that trigger a VAT requirement? The answer to that question is probably yes. And then when those goods are finally sold to consumers, as a business, you need to be able to make a decision whether on those sales, is it you who needs to account the VAT or is it the marketplace who needs to account the VAT? There is no general rule in terms of how this might work because there could be different scenarios where it is the marketplace who will pay the VAT or in some scenarios it might be the seller who pays the VAT. Usually what we recommend is this decision is based on uh, some kind of logic built into the system and the system allows you to make that decision when the customer is placing the order and pressing that checkout button on the website. So I think that would be from the business perspective but from a marketplace perspective this gets even more interesting. Now Although the marketplace has full visibility of the transaction and can see what sale has happened, but they would also need to ascertain what category, what type of product has been sold and what is the corresponding VAT rate that applies to it. Historically, marketplaces never got into that and they would usually pass that to the seller and the VAT determination will be based on what the seller suggests. But since burden has now shifted to them, they need to make that decision. They need to do that classification. And then they need to have that system and the logic built that if they are the one who are the deemed supplier, then depending on the location of the customer, what is the VAT rate that would apply? The second thing would be the invoicing requirement. In a lot of cases, the invoicing requirements would again shift onto the marketplace, although 
appreciating that schemes like one stop shop would allow exemption from invoicing but you still have to review those requirements and then be able to produce an invoice which is compliant from a very granular perspective other kind of practical questions and challenges clients have had is around the time of supply is the time of supply when the customer places the order or is the time of supply when the goods are shipped from the warehouse in a lot of these cases sometimes the marketplace will have information about all of this they can make that decision but in cases where it is not the marketplace who needs to pay the VAT, then how does the business who's actually making that sale get that data and make that decision accurately? The other challenge that arise is on account of foreign exchange, foreign currency fluctuation. Because these transactions are typically cross-border transactions, you might have a currency in which the supplier has listed their product, but the banking system might accept a different currency. So again, what currency do you choose? And if you need to convert, then what is the rate and how do you get those rates and what is the date on which those rates need to be used? So as you can see, there's lots to think about. I think the message from our side to most of the business we advise is while you can navigate through the VAT rules and you can understand where you have a liability and where it is a marketplace who has a liability, a lot of times the challenge is around getting that information timely and then to be able to make that decision. E-commerce is very quick it's very very fast so you need to really collect the taxes and duties accurately from the customer at the checkout stage if you don't do that you probably lose out on that money or you have a very poor customer experience which nobody wants so the key is really controlling that data the information and then to be able to configure a system that can allow you to make accurate decisions as we see there a lot, a lot of complexity that Garv just talked through there in terms of the different business models and again how the administrators are responding to that. In addition to that, we're also seeing this 3.0 vision that administrators are coming out with. And the goal really here is how to get more embedded within the tax ecosystem as part of the payment ecosystem or the business ecosystem. But really the goal is how do they make it more efficient for both themselves and businesses, as well as being able to better track actually where the payments are going, who they're going to, and who's doing business together with a view to getting more data on actual tax payments, where's the tax gap, and closing that broader tax gap, which again, of course, introduces more complexity. So if we take a quick look now at the actual real-time reporting, which again sits under that continuous transaction control alongside e-invoicing, which we'll have a look at later on. But if we take first a look at this real-time reporting and, and how that's converging into the core finance processes. If we look from the right here, the light blue, really that's the traditional reporting, which often would have been done after the fact. Maybe on a monthly or quarterly basis, someone would have done their filing based on what information was in their E or P system or within their e-commerce platform and what transactions they had there. What the administrators are trying to do, if we look at the, the darker blue or navy, is intersect the various payment flows or interaction flows between a business and a customer or a business and another business to speed up the time that they get access to that data. So we see here one to four days. We talk about real-time reporting, just different levels, right? You can see in the brackets, it says near real-time reporting. Uh, and again, some of it, depending on the administration, some of it is in real, real-time reporting, some of it's a day after, some of it can be three or four days after. But what that means for the actual authority then is they can have visibility of what's happening as close to real-time as possible, and they can react quicker to any discrepancies within that reporting and also match up both sides of the reporting. So if one business is reporting they made sales to another business and that business should be reporting that they actually purchased from business A, well actually now the authorities can start to look at that. The challenge however, and again if we go back to the, the very first slide where we talked about what the OECD are trying to do of course is that the administrations haven't introduced these rules in harmony. So while it looks simple on this slide here in terms of interact, actually when you start to go cross border, it doesn't sync up seamlessly at all. So therefore from a business perspective, now I may have to go and interact with multiple administrations based on their standards, build integrations via APIs and connections, which again becomes very complex. And as we move to the left, we said we talk a bit about e-invoicing later on, but however, one important piece here, if we look at the yellow, is this invoice clearance model. 
So again, we see more administrations introducing an e-invoice, not an online or digital invoice, which is really the production of a PDF uh, to an end customer, but the e-invoice, which would go through a government authority and that being passed through a clearance house from the buyer to the seller and vice versa, which again, when matched up with the real-time reporting, gives administrations a greater view into what's happening in real time. However, from a business perspective, adds more complexity. Again, there's not harmonization there. Let's take a deeper dive into, with all this complexity, why this is causing problems for business. So first up, if we just simply look at the, the VAT and GST obligations, and really what's critical here is to remember we're talking about multiple countries, multiple jurisdictions. No one goes into e-commerce really to sell in one jurisdiction. And we've seen people who've tried, and actually just with the, the way the internet is, even it's a challenge just to stay within one jurisdiction. We look at the top of this circle here, tax calc and determination. Why is that a challenge? Again, simple in one jurisdiction or if you have a very slim product line. But as you expand into multiple jurisdictions, you really have to be able to calculate the tax. And again, we're talking in real time at the point of sale, at the checkout for those multiple jurisdictions and be able to have accurate tax as well as determination, depending on, you know, we talked a bit there about marketplaces. Actually, you know, as Garth touched on, we have to determine now Who's actually liable on a marketplace for the tax? It's not as clear cut as always the marketplace or always the seller. Depending on the scenario, it could be the marketplace, the seller or the buyer. So we have to bear that in mind. Of course, out of the back of that, calculating tax liabilities down in the green here, very important. And Garv touched on it there in terms of, you know, again, if I'm in multiple jurisdictions, multiple different currencies, how am I calculating what that tax liability is? If the, you know, the buyer is paying in dollars, but actually the jurisdiction I'm in is Indian rupee. How do I calculate that and ensure that I'm using the right FX rate? We see more administrations introducing FX. And of course, within the VAT GST space over in the darker green, the compliance for US companies selling in the US, the compliance, while it's a burden, the focus is more on the content determination. When we go into the international space, again, we touched on it earlier on, the compliance becomes heavier around the filing, around the remittance of the currencies, invoicing standards, tax ID validation, and of course, the various different rates and calcs that we need to determine there. So really the focus here is talking about selling in a global market or a broader international market. If we look at how that complexity starts to manifest itself, and you know, sample here of 70 plus countries, how would the business manage that tax compliance? Really, we have the, the various players in the scenario here. And if you look at the diagram, if you're to take it with one tax authority, it may be fairly simple. Again, if we were selling in our own market or even into one other administration, it might be simple enough. But if we look at the bottom in terms of the challenges, when we start to go 70 plus, and we're counting the EU as those 27 countries as one administration or, or region, which we know isn't necessarily always the case. What we end up with is 50 registrations. That may mean I have to actually physically go into a country to register, or I have to build up a tax advisor relationship to help with that. There may be a fiscal rep involved. So I have to maintain, build those relationships as well as do the registration in the first instance. Number two then, we've talked about it tax engine, if you're using an external tax engine, great, or if it's internal, how do I keep those systems up to date with all of that data to ensure that I'm getting calculating the right rate and determining the right person who's liable? Into number three then, again with 70 plus countries, up to 400 monthly or quarterly filings per annum. And again, making sure I have the processes and structure in place to get those filings in. Often we see someone go to one of the big four or have their own reps in country but of course that becomes very expensive and a massive overhead and finally of course a piece that often we see is overlooked is in terms of actually how do I settle those liabilities if I'm doing 400 monthly quarterly filings per annum how do I do the 400 monthly quarterly settlements per annum and often I need a treasury partner then to be able to make those filings on my behalf and even the payments themselves have to be structured in a certain way and I need to make sure that that format's correct so that Post my filing, I can do the remittance on the back of it and they match up. There's no issues with bounce back of filing or penalties involved. If we look then at one of the big challenges in doing cross-border around identifying the buyer's location, we take an example here in terms of if we look at digital goods sellers, very hard to identify where that 
customer actually resides and to confirm they reside in the country where I'm calculating the tax. So from a buyer's perspective, they need to collect customer evidence. Now, what does that mean? Well, a lot of administrations, if we look at the bottom here, are now dictating the types of evidence that need to be collected to confirm that the buyer was in that location. So that's things like credit card bin, IP address, the country they say they're in, maybe a mobile number, but there's multiple pieces of information that need to be collected. I have to determine that in terms of based on, if I get four pieces of evidence, how do I actually determine which two I'm going to use and how do I build that into a hierarchy? And of course, if there's conflicts. So there's no reason why I couldn't be on a VPN in Ireland, say that I'm in whatever country it may be in the UK, but have a credit card from a different country and suddenly these evidence pieces don't match up. So how do I resolve that? And again, that's a big overhead for companies, just a very simple problem to be able to manage that. The foreign currency problem isn't just in the actual calculation of liability. We see on the left here, digital invoice or online invoice. I will show this in an example later on, but how do I ensure that if I have to put the local currency on the buyer invoice, that it's calculated at the right rate? And again, countries are starting to mandate, or administrations are mandating that the source of the FX rate and the timing the FX rate is taken from is consistent with their administration. So I can't just pick any FX source and decide this is the rate I'm going to use to my benefit. It's already started to be mandated. Of course, I need to calculate the tax liability correctly based on the currency I'm getting and the currency of the administration I'm in. And finally, then the remittance. So after the fact, after I've done my initial calculation, when I'm doing my final remittance, again, depending on where I am, if I'm a, a European seller and I'm settling in Indonesia, well, I need to convert my euros into the Indonesian currency to ensure that I'm remitting correctly and meeting my liability. We talked earlier on about tax ID validation. And of course, for a B2B business, the reverse charge mechanism is crucial both from a cash flow perspective, if I'm the seller, also crucial for ensuring that my pricing looks competitive. If I have a competitor who is instigating the reverse charge mechanism, has a good tax ID validation process in place, they'll be able to show their sales or their sale price as lower than if I can't do it and I have to collect the VAT as top of the actual sale price, then my prices look a bit less competitive and it puts an extra burden onto the buyer to go and reclaim that VAT. So important to get a good process around this. Again, the challenge here, everyone thinks of this and they think of Vs and they say, hey, I'm integrated with Vs, which is great for Europe, right? But of course, a simple example, the UK have their own tax ID validation service. So as I start to sell more broadly as a B2B business along the bottom here, I may have to start building integrations into all these regional sources. Again, an overhead. Some of them, what they will do is they'll put a CAPTCHA in front of the actual validation service, which has to be resolved. And if you take a country like Canada, well, actually there's dual validation. So there's a federal ID and a state ID. I need to be able to validate both of those if I'm doing business in Canada. And to manage this, you can almost think of it like content. I have to keep doing my online research or ongoing research and then change the system to be able to meet it. The alternative is I manage this manually, but again, then we're looking at human resource. I said I'd come back to e-invoicing, and it's important here to distinguish between online invoicing and e-invoicing or digital e-invoicing and e-invoicing. So online invoicing or digital, this is the creation of the invoice, the PDF, the HTML that I send to the end buyer as a receipt. Now, more administrations are ensuring or saying that this has to be compliant, and we'll take a deeper look at that in the solutions but there's multiple fields that need to be specified and certain things around languages, signatures that also need to be included dependent on the region. E-invoicing on the other hand, you know, this is back to this continuous transaction controls and this clearance process of when I make a sale, I have to send data in a certain format through the tax authority, through the clearance house, they'll pass it to the buyer and there's responses back and that then serves and helps with that real-time reporting after the fact. Again, the challenge here, as I already alluded to, there's no harmonization in standards. So even at a technical level and data standards, there's no harmonization. Again, there's you know, providers out there or authorities out there like PEPAL that are trying to standardize this, the OECD are trying to standardize, 
But again, if I'm not using a service provider for this, I'm going to have to build multiple integrations, keep on top of all the various changing regulations, and ensure that I abide by them. So on both sides of this, whether it's digital invoicing or e-invoicing, there's an overhead for the business. So finally, what we'll do today is we'll have a look at some of the solutions available to be able to mitigate some of these challenges that we see in the e-commerce space. First off, you know, the overall Vertex e-commerce portfolio solutions here. And we've talked through a lot of the problems. I think a couple of pieces that we didn't touch on that maybe we call out here, you know, again, down the bottom right, more specific to marketplaces. We see this liability assignment in terms of that three-party sale. You know, can I determine the difference between who's responsible from the marketplace, the seller and the buyer? So there's help there to help with that. And of course, the right then seller onboarding as a marketplace. How do I get my seller's data into my tax system to ensure that I'm tracking what the sales are there and I'm tracking who I've made liable and I'm able to report out on that and look at audit. And just final little piece along the bottom then, the blue banner is just a bit of help around the filing and remittance within the VAT GST space. So first off, if we look at location evidence, talked a bit about it in the problems there, really the solution here is being able to take on that data. So if we look on the left, the evidence types, IP address, credit card, tax number, billing country, you know, I also mentioned mobile phone data there as well. And being able to look at that, determine which country the tax should be paid in, and also being able to build a hierarchy in the background. We talked about the conflict of evidence. In this case, we have three different countries, the US, UK, and Ireland, and being able to decide, okay, if I have these four pieces of evidence, which are the top two or the top one that I'm going to refer to, to be able to determine what country that sale was made into. On the right-hand side here, what we see is this table is built around threshold monitoring. At the top here, we see what countries this company has enabled for our tax services. We see what countries are disabled, but there may be a tax responsibility within that country. And then in the gray, unsupported or no sales within that country. If we come down then to the taxation table, what we see is if we look in three columns from the right, we see the threshold monitor. So if we look at Albania here, we can see the thresholds being exceeded. If you look one step to the right under tax calculation, it's disabled. So the company, the business knows there's a challenge here. We may want well to enable the capability to actually meet that commitment. If we come down one step to Australia, we see this as amber or medium, and then to the right disabled. So maybe there's something to do in the future there or to monitor. If we come down two more to Bangladesh, we see it's low and disabled. Okay, again, may need to put on a monitor. And then come down one to Belarus, what we see is it says okay and enabled. So the services are enabled for that country. If we go over the threshold, then we're fully protected and we know we have the mitigations in place. As we move on to the transactions then, at the end of all this, what's critical for a business is the protection of whether you're ever audited or the efficiencies of being able to file. So really we need to understand the transactions to a good level of detail. If we look at the top right first, we see an example of a transaction. We can see the amount, the tax amount that was applied, which is zero, the total amount, and the reason the tax amount was applied is zero, because we see it's a B2B transaction as a kind, country was Ireland and the order date. Why are these other fields not filled in? Well, we can see at the bottom of the class, it's a digital transaction. If this was a physical transaction, we'd have all these other data points filled in. On the left-hand side, of course, very critical reporting, as I spoke to, audits and filing, very important to get that information out of the system. The system will keep a track or a record of all the transactions and allow the, the user to be able to produce reports when they're needed, whether that's for filing, or whether that's for an audit later on. I want to take a deeper look at the invoicing requirements very quickly. What we see here is an example of a compliant invoice, and it's an invoice for Saudi Arabia. Basic details, if we look, seller address and tax ID, description of goods. But of course, the administrations, again, as I said, are becoming more sticky around what needs to be on an invoice. So the top right, we see sequential numbering, unique and sequential numbering. That's very important now. I can't just put any invoice number onto an invoice anymore. If I get audited, the auditor will want to check, okay, am I producing invoices in a sequential manner? And is each invoice number unique? Of course, producing the buyer's tax ID on a B2B invoice, very important. And we've heard stories of buyers with 
non-compliant invoices, when they go to reclaim VAT, if they haven't used the reverse charge mechanism, if they go to reclaim VAT, being refused that VAT reclaim. And we spoke about FX earlier on. And again, we see here administrators saying, hey, you have to produce the invoice with the local currency on the invoice. It's not enough to produce it in dollars in this example. I also need it in the Saudi Riyadh. So in addition to that, if we look at an invoice in a different language, this is again some administrators saying it's not enough to produce the invoice in English or the language of whatever country you're producing the invoice from. You have to produce it in the language of our country. In this case, this is Arabic. So you can produce one invoice for Arabic or maybe you have to produce an invoice in English and Arabic, depending on what the administrator advises. I think there's 13 different countries at this point that ask for that service. And finally then, in addition to producing invoices in certain languages with the FX and so on, different administrators are also asking, I think there's three or four at this point, that there's a signature, a nominated signature from the business on every invoice. Again, a very simple requirement, but however, as an overhead and ensuring that stays in place, need a solution that will be able to apply that signature on an ongoing basis on every invoice in an automated manner. I think overall, what we're hearing back is businesses are looking for a better approach. What does that mean? Well, they want better integration between their systems. If I have an ERP or a, an e-com platform, I want to make sure that my tax information is integrated in that and I can manage it very simply, particularly if I have a dedicated engine. In the e-com space, real-time calculation, critical. We want that frictionless experience for our customers, so we don't want tax to become a barrier, a calculation of tax to become a barrier there. Additionally, we know there's platforms out there. I think the survey said, hey, we're managing a lot of this through our, our poll earlier on said we're managing a lot through our ERP. But there's only so much those systems can do and they're not dedicated tax engines. So really, if I want to expand, I want to look into a specialist tax engine and get that efficiency, operational overhead out of the way, take my resources and focus them on something else rather than developing out indirect tax. I think overall, the Vertex e-commerce, our goal is really to help businesses to transact from anywhere to anywhere. We really want to help businesses expand and accelerate global commerce. How do I do that? Well, we don't want tax to be a barrier. So we want it to be end-to-end -end solution, we want to support it globally, make sure it's automated, get those operational efficiencies. We also know there's certain jobs that are already being done. So it's not necessarily a transformation change project, but we can take certain modules from our solutions, plug them in to fill the gaps. Again, trying to keep the technical resources free, so a simple integration is possible. And of course, everybody wants to scale. Anybody who's doing e-commerce, they want to scale. We want to ensure our system can scale with your business. There's a lot of complexity out there. Growing business, a lot of opportunity out there. We have the solutions that can help with that growth and ensure that tax doesn't become a problem. Okay, great. To Niall and to Gaurav, thank you so much for your input here. And to our audience, thank you for attending. We look forward to welcoming you next time. Thank you and goodbye.